That's good. All the time. All the time. That is good. Did you insert this one? talk about one of the most bizarre stories, I think, in the Bible. And we're going to switch slides really quick so we can uh, pull up the PowerPoints to go along with this. While Wendy pulls that up, I want you to think about this story of Jacob wrestling with God. All night long, he's wanting to pin God to the mat, so to say. And so, the story is one of those where it's out of the frying pan and into the fire, so to speak. Uh, Jacob has just left Laban, and he serves him for how many years? Does anyone remember? 20. 20 years, yeah. These 20 years I've served you, you know. Your ewes haven't been lost, you know. I, any goats that are missing, I pay for it type thing. And, of course, he wanted to marry Rachel. And what happens? Get stuck with Leah, whose eyes were weak. That's an interesting way of saying she's probably not very attractive, right? And so um, he serves for seven years for each daughter, and then it's time to leave. And he's on his way back to his own home country, and who is he afraid of running into? Esau. So it's out of the frying pan. I'm, I'm leaving Laban, and, and I'm, I'm afraid of Esau. So that kind of sets the context for this story. The story of Jacob wrestling with God through the night is a story that starts in fear and ends up with a stronger faith than before. And for me, the story is kind of interesting because it highlights the idea you're either fighting with your family or you're fighting for your family. And Jacob is experiencing both here. He's fighting with Laban and he wants to leave and establish his own household, right? He wants to be able to reap the rewards of his own prophets. He wants to get away from him. And as he's going back, he's afraid of Esau because Esau is ready to kill him. In fact, isn't that why Jacob left in the first place? Because he was afraid for his life. So, that's all right. Don't, that's okay. That's all right. Just pretend in your imagination, guys. The slides will be there. And it's all right. Don't worry about it, Wayne. I keep looking while you're talking. Nah, don't, don't, don't worry about it. And get off Facebook, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a story that starts in fear. And, and that's kind of the motivation here. And that's not always a bad motivation. Uh, it's not the healthiest. It's not the most mature. But it's not always that terrible. So in, in Genesis uh, 32, here's Jacob. At the beginning, he's on his way and the angels of God meet him. And so, oh, this is God's camp. But then at the end of the chapter, uh, look at how it starts off the paragraph. That same night he arose, he takes his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 children, and he crosses the ford, he crosses the river. Thank you. And so here he is. And, and here is the Lego version of Jacob wrestling God. Look at this. He's got him in his arm bar. He's going for the submission bowl here. I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And so thank you for finding that one. So uh, here he is. And so he sends them across, and, and he waits there. And it says a man wrestles him until the break of day. I don't know if you thought about that or not, but that takes a lot of endurance, wrestling. And, and they're obviously physically grappling here. It's back and forth, it's back and forth. And we read the story, and think, gosh, this is such a physical story. But yet there's a spiritual reality to it, too. And that is that we wrestle with God. And you say, no, we don't, because we're good Christians, and that would be wrong. And you should never wrestle with God, because he's always going to win. Well, um, yes, God is always going to win. Um, but this is one of those great stories that shows us it's not wrong to wrestle with God. And in fact, I think we almost need to be more vocal with the fact that we wrestle with God. Now, Christians have a bad rap. Atheists believe that we're just simple-minded people. You know, cynics, agnostics, non-believers think that it's just blind faith, that we just accept every premise of Scripture, that we just accept everything about faith blindly. But yet, to be a believer, stop and think about it for a moment. We have to wrestle 
but some really thought-provoking issues in justice, in the pages of Scripture and off. You know, slavery is not a nice topic to talk about. Why is slavery allowed in Scripture? Why is human slavery still continuing today? The mistreatment of women. There were some women that were really mistreated in Scripture. Right now, there's a lot of women mistreated in our culture today. We have to wrestle with the idea of, of injustice and persecution of other believers. I read something this past week that somewhere around 7,000 believers have been killed in the Middle East in 2015. I guess it would be like ISIS and, and other forms of uh, Islamic persecution. 7,000 believers. Have you seen in the news all of these wonderful archaeological sites, these old churches like in Iraq and Iran that are just being destroyed. All this rich history is being destroyed. I've read statistics too about churches in China, house churches, where the pastors are just taken out and just killed. No trial, no, no nothing. We have to deal with that. We have to wrestle with this idea uh, that we're persecuted. In fact, I think God hears some of that. You can turn to Revelation chapter 6 if you want. I'm just going to read a few verses. Uh, Revelation 6, verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. So here's John's vision in heaven. Right? I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, uh, who were to be killed as they themselves have been killed. Oh Lord, how long until you avenge us? How long will you let this injustice roll on? So we have to deal with that. That should be things that keep us up at night, wondering, questioning, arguing, wrestling. What about pain? The Bible's not silent about pain. You remember Mary and Martha? John chapter 11, Lazarus, he's dead, he's in the grave. Jesus is going there. Both sisters confront him. And what do they say to him? Jesus? If you, huh? If you, if you had been here, where were you? What happened? How could you let this happen? Why do we see pain around us today? Again, not to use the book of Job as a cliche, but that is a book that is filled with pain, arguing with God, blaming God, wrestling with God. And then we've got some questions that can really rock our confidence. I saw in the news last week that they found, and I forget what the name of it is, when a star explodes. Is that the supernova? Does that sound right? Okay, they found a supernova that's, listen to this, 58 billion times brighter than the sun, which is supposed to be impossible. And I forget what the mass of it was. It was extremely larger uh, than our sun. It was 58 billion times brighter than our sun, and it is defying all the laws of astrophysics. It's supposed to be impossible. And so we look at how big our universe is and all these things that are going on there. And have you ever really wondered what was there before the universe began? And I believe the biblical um, layout for creation that God speaks and it happens, right? God calls the universe into existence. But what was in that space before there was no space? What's on the outside of our universe? Our universe is big and it's expanding faster. Right now it's expanding almost at the speed of light. All the galaxies are moving away from each other, almost at the speed of light. The universe is pretty big. There's at least 200 billion galaxies that astronomers can see. What's on the outside of that? And if that doesn't cause your mind to stir, I want you to ask yourself this question. How could there have been an eternity 
in the past before God created the universe with time and space? And how does eternity never end after the universe, time, and space no longer exist? Well, maybe you haven't had your Starbucks yet this morning. But those are some big questions. And somehow God is above and beyond, and somehow he's inside and he functions within this. And, and scripture touches on these type of topics. Right now, one of the current theories that's being proposed about the Milky Way galaxy that we live in, the center of the Milky Way, it's not chocolate nuggets, okay, let me tell you. They're saying there's a black hole at the center of our galaxy that's sucking everything into it. Scripture talks about creation, talks about the universe, talks about the stars. And of course, if you're going to talk about the universe, what about evolution? How does that fit in? I mean, you can't deny that if um, you want to change a species over time, that you can do some fine tuning with your breeding and you can take, a, oh, let's say a Rottweiler and some other dog and you make what? A Doberman. Then, now, that's not Darwinistic evolution, and I don't buy into Darwinism at all. But what do we do with some of the things that seem to be on the side of evolution, that seem to contradict what we look at in common sense and reason? We have to think through those things. And Scripture talks about a God. He talks about nature, talks about creation, talks about where we are. And, that, and then what about the hopelessness that we can see in I mean, there's some things that can seem pretty bleak when we look around. Um, conflict with other people, crime, intergenerational poverty that we see in big cities that just doesn't seem to get any better. The world doesn't seem like it's getting to be a better place. And then sometimes we're mistreated by people who we worship God with. People misuse their free will. Here's something for you to tweet. I think sometimes the question isn't, why do bad things happen to good people? We ask that all the time. Oh, they're such a good person, you know. Why do little five-year-olds get cancer? Why do bad things happen to good people? I think the question is sometimes, why do good people do bad things to other people? To me, that's more baffling than why do bad things happen to good people? Why do good people do bad things to bad people? It, it, and I'm looking at all this because sadly, the reality of it is, a lot of believers who have been well nurtured on the word of God, who've had a close connection with their creator, who have worshipped with their friends, will disengage. Their faith will be derailed. They'll, they'll get off the Jesus train, which, by the way, is a great song if you've never heard that one by Tony Mack. Um, they'll look at injustice. They'll look at pain. They won't find questions to their answer. They're, they'll see hopelessness. And, and sadly, a lot of people grow up in a church culture where it's wrong to have questions. You're punished if you ask questions. You're ostracized. You're, you're, you're basically shamed. And so people become ashamed. They detach from their faith, and they're either intimidated by the fight or they're ashamed of the fight, and so they give up. And that's why I love the story of Jacob. Because there in chapter 32, he's afraid. He's fearful. He's trying to save his family and his own skin, and he wants God to bless him, and he doesn't give up. He doesn't quit the fight with God. He keeps wrestling. And in the midst of that, he gets a name change. Which is pretty interesting because God says, what's your name? Like he doesn't know. They're wrestling. Let go of me. I've got other things to do. i got a universe to run here. Nope. Not going to let go until you bless me. Well, what's your name? Well, my name's Jacob, which means what? Huh? Deceiver. Deceiver, yeah. He's heel catcher. He's a deceiver. And then God says, well, I'm going to change your name to Israel, which means what? 
means you wrestle with God. That's what Israel means. It means to wrestle with or to contend with God. Yeah. So when you look at the nation of Israel, I wonder how they go around there. I don't know what America means. I mean, it's a, it was a America was just a, a name on a map before we ever got to become a, a country, right? Some guy decides to call us America, right? So we're Americans. Israelites, though. Hey, what's your nationality? Well, we're those people who wrestle with God. Yeah, Israel in, in Hebrew means to wrestle or to contend with God. So your name is Jacob, but I'm going to change your name to Israel. Which is kind of interesting because when you think about it, he wrestles with God who can't be. You remember the old movie Rocky back in the 70s? Yeah, Rocky Balboa, he goes up against who? Apollo Creed. And at the end of all those 12 rounds, who's the winner? Apollo Creed. But you don't even think about that when you watch the movie. Who's the hero? Rocky. Not because he won, but why? Because he doesn't quit. And here's a thought that I think we should hold on to. God embraces the, the scared, the cynical, and the seeker. It's okay to be scared. Jacob is scared out of his mind when he's wrestling with he also seems to be a little bit cynical to me. A little bit worried about if God's going to protect him or not. A little bit worried about what his brother's going to do to him. God embraces the scared, the cynical, and the seeker. Now, when you look at Jesus in the Gospels, Jesus never has a problem with people who seem scared or cynical or who are seeking truth. Who is it that Jesus does have a problem with? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Why? Because they're overconfident. They depend on their own willpower. They depend on their own abilities. But they think they have all the answers figured out. They don't have any questions. They don't have any doubts. They don't wrestle with these complexities. In fact, I'd say they're just a little bit prideful. So faithful fighters like Jacob are rewarded not because they win, but because they don't give up. We're rewarded for not quitting. And sometimes winning, sometimes winning, is the byproduct of completion. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews, please. Hebrews chapter 11. And since it's really snowy out and no one has anything else to do because of the cold weather, I'm just kidding. I'm going to spend extra time on it. I wish we could spend time just unpacking all of chapter 11. But I just want to hit two highlights in chapter 11. So if you're in Hebrews chapter 11, let's begin in verse 13. Um, all the people that the Hebrew author has just talked about. Um, These all died in faith. Whoa. This doesn't sound like this is going to sell really big or win a lot of people over. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. So all the things that are promised, they don't receive in their lifetime. Now, if you're still in Hebrews, uh, let's Jump over to verse 32. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, and were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women, verse 35, received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. All, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And then verse 39 comes along. And the Hebrew writer says, And all these, though commended through their faith, what's that say? It, just, it has to be a typo in my Bible. 
What's that say? Did not receive. Uh, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So winning, whatever that may be, sometimes, sometimes as a byproduct of completion. So, wow, that's all some pretty heavy stuff. <coughs> God embraces us, but how do I keep from giving up? I'm disillusioned, I'm disappointed. When the darkness seems to be engulfing me, when the fight is too intimidating, when I'm too ashamed, when I don't know that I can wrestle with God anymore, what do, what do I do? How do I keep from giving up? Well, for Jacob, I think he found the ability to go on because he was afraid for his family. I, I think you know, he was worried about his wife, uh, his wives, I should say, uh, his livestock. Uh, he, he was worried about his own skin. And so for Jacob, he's motivated because he thinks about his family's welfare. So he goes from faith to crisis to fear to a stronger faith where he could have given up. Well, Esau is going to kill me anyway because he was always bigger and stronger. He's got this huge army that's just waiting to get me. Uh, you know, I think I'm going out to follow God, but I don't know where, what's going on. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm just But he doesn't. He continues to fight physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So for Jacob, he's motivated as he thinks about his family. For some people, though, I think they find the motivation to continue the fight through the ties of their community, their faith community. I think sometimes you lean on other people's faith when your faith is weak. I think sometimes other people are able to encourage us. And sometimes I think there is a bit of power in reflecting on those past relationships, the activities you've been involved in, things that you do together. For other people, and I'm not saying any of these are right or wrong, I'm just, just sharing with you some ways where people continue to be motivated when the wrestling match seems to be overbearing. I think some people just consider, consider the alternatives. If I quit, if I give up, what are the consequences? Because I think inside we have the Holy Spirit who nudges us, who guides us, who prompts us. And I think when we decide, I think I want to quit the fight, I think it's a wake-up call to look at the alternatives to not being faithful or to consider the consequences. And for other people, I think holding on to God in that wrestling match is just simply bitter determination because you want to see good triumph over evil. I'm going to continue in this fight because I don't want to see evil win. <coughs> but the final point, and let me just say this, we don't pursue the bells and the whistles of faith um, just to have the glamour of faith. Um, but I think we have to Consider what Moses keeps his eye on. Now, I had a hard time narrowing down which verse I wanted to use for Hebrews 11.27. And so this is a screenshot from Bible Gateway. If you've never used Bible Gateway, uh, let me recommend it to you. You can pull up four or five translations at once and look at them. And so I wanted to really get to the heart of Hebrews 11.27. <clears throat> but I couldn't pick a verse, so I went ahead and I, I pulled up a few of them for you. The New American Standard says, By faith, Moses, he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. Now the Holman Standard Bible says, By faith, again, it's talking about Moses, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. New Living Translation. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. The nearly inspired version, I mean the New International Version says, by faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He 
persevered because he saw him who was invisible. And then the new revised standard version. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who was invisible. So, if I want to continue when the wrestling match seems too hard, I, I want to reflect on Moses. And I want to keep going, looking at the things that are unseen. So, let me finish with this. This is going to be really profound, okay? Are you sitting down? Whatever it takes, don't let go of God. 